Darwin wrote seven books about plants because he was trying to illustrate the concepts of natural selection. And plants offered good examples for these modifications through descent. Uh, also, people during this age were very well educated in botany. Do you have other ideas about this? It was a botanical century. You have to think of the 19th century as the botanical century. Darwin sitting down after on the origin of species. Remember how this man was often publicly vilified for, for what he actually wrote. So what does he do? He sits down and says, all right, I will test my hypotheses. We will look at these things that people insist do not evolve. We will look at organs that people insist have no function, and we will perform some simple experiments. Working with plants was considerably easy because this was a century in, pe in which people grew all sorts of, uh, of, of plants and wanted more. There were fads. What we're looking at here are some cultivated versions of the wild European primroses. Uh, people competed for prizes with these plants. They, uh, they bred them and then they attended what were called florist feasts as a form of competition. Um, as far as the orchids are concerned, this was a century in which there were fads for orchids. It's not really that much of a surprise that the first plant book Darwin wrote after On the Origin of Species appeared in 1862, and it was all about orchid pollination. And you can see the modification with the labellum right here. That's the pouch. The pouch where the insect travels through and has to contact the stigma. It's just a modified petal. Right, a modified petal and the modified staminode that, which covers the uh, reproductive structures. People look at flowers and assume, Darwin assumed, that flowers were actually offering food for sex, that is the flower, the uh, insects came to the flower, consumed some sort of floral product, had some pollen brushed on them, and then they went on to the next flower and you had cross-pollination. Darwin uh, assumed it was largely a mutualistic response. Everybody benefits. The pollinator gets something, the pollinated flower gets something in the form of useful sperm. Uh, that can be used to turn into seeds. But orchids have taken a different route. Yes, there are orchids that are offering a nice sweet nectar. If we were to go, say, from, say, Mexico down through uh, Brazil, we would find a large number of orchids that are producing these wonderful uh, essential oils. These are, uh, uh, these smell rather very spicy, like oil of cloves. And certain bees, but only male bees, go to these flowers. They uh, collect them. Uh, they make their own sort of cologne. And these are used later uh, in the process of reproduction. No one's really quite sure what's happening, but the male odor attracts other males. These males dance, and this is apparently what attracts the attention of the female. Uh, the take-home message here is that this and this have absolutely nothing inside them that an insect can use. The purple dendrobium here has a pretty scent, nice colors, but if we were to cut open this little spur at the base of the uh, flower, there's no nectar being secreted. The bee comes in and is deceived. In the case of the Paphiopetalum, the yellow spot on the staminode uh, looks like a glob of pollen to a female insect, but there's nothing, th uh, there's nothing there. Generally, we find that uh, most species of orchids are tricking their pollinators into, into coming, and frequently insects wise up, and uh, they don't visit maybe more than two or three flowers before they get the idea that this is a trap and they don't come back.